So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ines, and this is Architectural Patterns of Resilient Distributed Systems. Uh, I do have a pug, and I really like him, so you may see some photos there of dogs that are similar to mine. So who am I? Oh, that's one that I found in the street. So I live in San Francisco, so once I found a lady with a very small one, and I, I went crazy for it. So my name is Ines. I'm a distributed systems engineer at this company called Fastly. I, also, I go by um, a random mood on the Twitters. And I also help run the San Francisco chapter of Papers We Love. Uh, you, uh, in Spain, there's a Madrid chapter. There's chapters on every city. And this organization uh, aims to like, bring academic research closer to practitioners. So I would really encourage you to join your own chapter. And, uh, and let's get started. Uh, I mentioned that I work for a company called Fastly. I don't know uh, if you know what, a, what, what Fastly is. We're a content delivery network, and it works this way. So you basically, you come, you bring your content to us. We spread it all over the globe, and then uh, it becomes like closer to your users. So the web experience is much better, but we're like so much more than that. Imagine a, a, a globally distributed cache layer that you can also program, and then you got real-time login, instant purging. It's very nice. We're very like. I, I help with uh, making sure that your bits make it there. So give us a try. Nice. Uh, so this is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start a little bit about motivation, what led me to, like, to start exploring this question, uh, a little bit what, what happens, what, what can we find in, in research, and also what, how industry maps these concepts that we find in research, and a little bit more conclusions. And then in the conclusion section, I'll get to like, ponder about the world, and maybe you agree with me, or maybe you don't. Um, but OK, let's define resilience, or what do I mean by this? So resilience is the ability of a system to adapt or keep working when changes occur. So whenever situations that are, that are planned, or unlike actually most of the time it's like things that are unplanned, how well our system adapts to those situations, and how much, can we, how much progress can we make when, when things are, um, are not the way that we plan them? So let's define a little bit more what I mean. I'm going to toss into the term resilience or into the bucket resilient a lot of other things as well. I'm going to talk about fault tolerance, evolvability of a system, the scalability of a system, failure isolation, and then also like complexity management. So that's what I mean when I talk about resilience right now. And, uh, and why do I care about it? Uh, I care about it because it's a thing that matters, right? We can have a very nice UI, very nice product, but if our product is not up and if our product, our product doesn't really like our system doesn't keep making progress, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's like, like this is the thing that, that, really, like, that is really important. So, so right. So this, this came to me because uh, a few years ago, then I became a distributed systems engineer. And, and, and I had been exposed to research. But when the perspective changed, all of the research became new to me. And all of these questions became things that I started to ponder on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the thing that I want to know is like, OK, how do I construct more resilient systems now? Sometimes when you go to a new job, you have pre-existing applications, and you can see some of the patterns and some of the problems that these applications may have. And sometimes you start a new system, and you're making all of these decisions yourself, and you know that some poor soul and some poor, poor person is going to have to live with all of the consequences of everything you selected or everything you picked today. And, uh, and that is an interesting thing, right? Like, you could be making somebody's life a living hell two years down the road if your system is successful. So I wanted to like, make sure that my applications or my systems just I, I actually did not cause a person to like, swear my past self and, and, and just like, I would like to be able to see this person on the street and say hello. So how do we construct more resilient systems? Let's think about it from a term of, of, of literature. So, so normally, when I'm confronted with a problem, I just try to go and see what I can read about it and how other people have solved it, and then just like I try to contrast it with what is happening right now, and then try to just mesh them together. So, so in literature, we're going to cover three models that that, that really thought like that really shaped my thinking when it comes to what I what I think about when I, when we talk about resilience. So the first model that we're going to do is an oldie but a classic. Uh, this is the harvest and yield model. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this paper. Can I see some hands? Uh, one? OK, cool. Uh, cool. This is great, because I thought I was going to be like, here and telling you something that you already knew. So this is, this is fantastic. So, right. so this paper came about in 1999, and it formalized a lot of the concepts that we use right now to build our application. So some of the things you're going to be like, duh. But, but the, the, they were the discussed, and then the, the, the patterns that, that we use now were first formalized in this paper. So this came out of Berkeley. Uh, so let's, let's see. It, it's like it has two concepts that, are, that, are, that are, like, are used to just describe the behavior of a system. You have yield, 
And your list is the fraction of the su successfully answered queries. Also, I tend to speak very fast, and I don't know if people are following along. So I was supposed to get a visual cue. Somebody here, tell me if I'm speaking fast. OK. All right. All right, th th this is good. Uh, do I have to catch, do I have to like, eh? or no? I, are we, everybody, is everybody here, like, can we follow to why I care about this? Is that clear? OK, so we know why I give a shit about this. So we know that there's going to be like models in literature, and then this one, a literature by I mean research, and then the first one is going to be harvest and yield, and it addresses a specific thing about system design. So we have two concepts that are important. The first one is called yield, uh, which is kind of a funny word, but yeah, it means how much information I get back from my system. And, and, and you can think about it as uptime, but it's not uptime. I, I, it's, it's much more focused on, on like your, your experience as a, as a user of this application rather than how, how available is your application. Say, for example, during Christmas, you're trying to do shopping because Americans do a lot of their shopping for Christmas. It's like it defines who they are as, as people, uh, <laughs> how well you shop for Christmas. So imagine that you have a system like the, the Shopify system that is unavailable for two minutes during Christmas season. And you can have the same system that is unavailable for two minutes in the middle of a weekend at 3 a.m. in the morning. Like, this is why it's not uptime. It's that they're different impact to your customer use base. So everybody understands yield now, right? All right, let's see what harvest is. Harvest is a different perspective on the same problem. So harvest is the fraction of the completed result. And then we have this example to kind of illustrate the point. Say uh, you know that I like, I like, I like bugs, and, and say that I wanted to look for cute baby animals. And then in this, system, in this particular application, we have a sharded database. And then in some side, in server A, I have things that are cute or things that have been tagged cute. In server B, I think things that are like babies. And in, thing, in server C, I have animals. So if I wanted to get the cute babies and the animals, then I would send a query to the three of things, and then like, I will get information from the three of them. So say, for example, that, that like, the thing where babies are held, the server that babies, like, not the babies, the babies are not down, but the server that has the babies is down, I would still get something pretty good, right? I would get cute animals, and maybe like I'm going to get some animals that happen to be babies, but I still can do some progress, and my system can still be responsive, even though I don't have the entirety of my data set. So in this particular case, it makes sense. Like We have 66% of harvest, but I still respond, and I still make progress. So we understand yield, we understand harvest now. And the thing that this paper gave us is like two particular models to start thinking about availability. And, and, and one is probabilistic availability, and they use two things. It's like, how do we degrade or how we respond to, to failures? And this is where like, the concept of graceful degradation came about. So this paper is really nice. I think you should, like, you should all read it. But it's like, it's like we keep making progress, and we choose either things that are probabilistic availability or, or the, next, the next pattern. And then in this case, they have a few mechanisms that allow you to use the first approach. And, and the first one could be randomness. Like in my example before, I have information that makes it randomly to different servers. And, and, and that is good because you reduce the chance of a particular piece of content being down. And then the second one is replication. You can make copies of it. And then if one copy is down, you can still return the other copy. So this is why the, the authors call probabilistic availability. And, and, and yes, and then sometimes you can even degrade the results based on the client capability. For example, if you have a bad internet connection and you're trying to watch a video, the video may come with less quality. And, and this is like less harvest. It's like less information. It's less rich. But you can still watch it. So all right, so this is approach number one. How are we doing with the speed? OK? Yeah, good. All right, so normally what I'm going to, is going to happen, I'm going to start running out of time, and then I'm going to pick it up at the end. So we're going to go through this together. I'm trying to do very well now. Uh, so all right, the second approach is decomposition and orthogonality. And this means it's just like that you don't have to solve all of the problems in the same application. You can break it apart, and then your subsystems can deal with, with, with the problems in, in a much more isolated way. Or you can actually have things that are completely different. And the example that they present in this paper is, for example, dealing with like certs or like security. Like sometimes maybe you can use a library that does encryption for you, and you don't have to build your application with encryption on it. This is what they call orthogonality. So that is nice. 
So we have some, something that allows us first to just have availability that is probabilistic, and the other one is just a thing so we can break them apart and have, so have components that handle one specific thing. But I think that the true contribution, or the thing that I like the most about this paper, and, and it's strange because like, as I keep going along, I keep back, going back to the paper, and I keep picking up more things that I missed the first time, is that, that the, the main takeaway for me is that if your system fa favors one versus the other, it's a, favor of it, it's a, it's a factor of its design. Ah, disappeared. So uh, it's, a, it's an outcome of its design. So like if, you don't, like if you don't choose one way or another, it's very hard to put it, put it later. So that is, I think, the contribution of this paper. All right, the second model comes from a completely different area. And this is what I'm going to call the Cook and Rasmussen model. And I, Richard Cook is a physician. And he talks a lot about system safety. And I got a chance to meet him this year and at a conference. And I was very weird. And I was like, oh, I've seen all of your talks on your paper. And he was very weirded out. But I really like him. So this is also a very good. Uh, and he also wrote a paper called How Complex Systems Fail. That is a very, very nice, very nice one. But this is his model. So you have this, this, this universe. And then in the middle of it, you have what is called the operating point. And the operating point is always in motion. In one side, you have economic failure boundary, the things that are economically feasible or not for you to do. In the other side, you have the unacceptable like, workload boundary. If something is like, very tedious to do, then you're likely just going to violate that boundary. Or things that are just the accident, whenever like, things go really bad. So the operating point is in motion and in most. And sometimes you would have different, like, different pressures that get point, like, they could place on the operating point. So in here, we have pressures towards efficiency. We want to just like, save more money, and then it moves there closer to an accident. Or sometimes like, we want to do like, less work, and we just want to cut a corner. And then sometimes then, when those pressures apply, then the operating point goes over a boundary, and then we have an incident. And, and if you have an incident, it's never really fun. And you decide to get your shit together and be like, oh, we need to like, make sure that we do our things correctly. And then you have some pressure to add more safety. And then the operating point comes back into the center. So this happens a lot. And what ends up creating is, is a boundary that is like, it's called a marginal boundary. And, and this is like redefines how close you are to having an error. So this thing sounds very nice in principle, but uh, we know that we like sometimes to cut corners. We know that sometimes we just don't do things like, or we don't test things as, as thoroughly as we should. And then there's, some, there's, some, um, there's something that happens when you're close to this boundary. And it's called like flirting with the margin. So say that we have a, this thing, and then we have a, a, an, an estimation or an intuition of the things that we need to do not to, good, not to have another problem. So we're like from the, to, to the, like, what is it for a mu? Right hand side. Of the, of the boundary, of the marginal boundary. And then like, well, today we didn't do as much as we thought we were going to. And then we we're like, oh, we didn't have an incident. And then maybe we we're like freak out about it. And it's like, tomorrow I'm going to actually enable my tests. And then now I have tests. But the last time the test didn't pass, I deleted it and we're fine. So might as well just do this now. And I'm getting really comfortable with this area. So what ends up happening is that I end up redefining how close I am to the, to the error boundary without even knowing. So this is normally what happens <laughs> when we start doing this. We have this illusion that it's fine, but we never really know how close we are to the accident boundary, and we keep pushing this limit. So the insights from this model were like, like this, this thing of how close we are to an incident or how close we are to an error was very, like, was very important to me because the, the, the paper defines that resilience is a factor of like, how you operate a system. It's a factor of how you explain the system to people that are, that are new, uh, how you respond to when an incident happens, what happens whenever you know that you have to change parts of your application, and also like, how you learn from the mistakes that you have, how you keep redefining how close you want to be to this error boundary. And also that, that the, safety, like, the safety is it's not about necessarily about what can happen, but it's also what you do whenever bad things happen. But this is from an operational perspective. The one before was from a design perspective. And, and Cook like, reminds us that how we operate our applications are very important in order, they're very important for us to build resilience. OK, so he also tells us how we can engineer things with, with system resilience. We want to like, uh, build support for continuous maintenance. Maintenance is something that is going to happen the moment that we have a system out. And, and the moment that a system goes into production, if it's doing anything worth doing, it will become a critical system in your organization. It will become something that is like we need to have like some safety in order to just like in order to keep making progress. 
So those are the things. And then I don't know how am I doing on time. 42. Eh. Uh, okay, and then also the, the main important thing is that he says that we should like we should give control of our applications or our systems to the operators, and the operators are going to do crazy shenanigans with your applications, and then you can't prevent that. So you might as well just expose the knobs and expose the dial and let the operators do whatever they're going to do, and then you react and then you put things in place as as problems go along. So this is how like how Cook and Rasmussen tell us that we should think about resilience in our applications. And also they say that we should think about configurations and interfaces, because people want to like, be able to interact with our configuration, and then um, it's much better explained in the paper, so like, I encourage you to read it as well. OK, so design, how we operate, and then this is a third model that, that also informed my thinking. And in San Francisco, there's this person called Paul Borrell, and he's the best synthesizer of papers. So this, this, this model comes with all of these papers. And then there's a bunch of literature that I have assembled for you that if you want to like, go through Paul's work, you can, you can follow along. But I'm going to call this the Borel model, because that's his last name. So Paul tells us that we can split, uh, we can think about in a system complexity in a sense of like in a continuum, where we have a rank of things and the probability of failure. And in the literature, like, it's a little bit more explained. But uh, because I don't really have that much time, he splits this, this work into three main areas. And you have things that we consider traditional engineering, things that we consider reactive things, like that they're based on operations. And then also there's this area that is called unk unk. Uh, and it stands for unknown unknown. And what he says is that this thing keeps going on forever. And at some point, everything that is unknown, if you fold it into the first two categories, has the same like surface as the first two. And, and Cascading of catastrophic failure comes in this unk unk section. Because if we would have known that they were going to happen, we would have already like, used the strategies before to catch it. But, but anything that has to do with the unknowns are things that we couldn't possibly predict. And this is where the tricky parts of the system, this is why building distributed systems is also very hard. So what Paul also tells us is that, OK, there are different failure areas, and we need different strategies and different, like, different approaches to deal with them. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work that Carl Kingsbury has done to prove the correctness of a, of a database. But we have in an area, then, for Paul, anything that Kyle has done to prove like, how distributed systems work deals with things that attack the first two areas. And then we have another researcher, uh, and his name is Peter Alvaro, that wrote a very important paper two years ago called Molly, where he attempts to reason from a correct system design to see where it could have gone wrong. So say that I did a computation that gave me a good state. He tries to chop the computation and analyze the execution path to see if the problem arrives to the same, like if the program arrives to the same good spot. So it's kind of crazy that he does this, but he reasons from the outcome up to see what are the things that, that, that could be going wrong. So he's saying that, all right, we have people that are already attacking these two things, these two areas. And collectively, we can do something that, that, that is more robust and is more resilient. So, so that is interesting about the, the Borel model, where we now have an awareness that first we can have design and we can have everything that traditional engineering gives us. And then we can have things that we can do in operation to reduce like, the likelihood for us to have a problem. And then we have things that we can't do anything about. And at that point, we're screwed. Uh, <laughs> okay, but there's some things that you could do, right? Like in classical engineering, we have things like coding standards, we have programming patterns, we have like testing of the full system. And if you know, like, uh, like what I mean by the full test system is that you have to test in a distributed system the client, the server code, and also the provisioning code because most people don't necessarily like test the provisioning code. If your system takes a configuration, the thing that configures it should be tested as well as what your system does whenever the configuration is wrong because that is going to happen. And also, that, that are right, and, and, and we think about this, 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 uh, this, the systems as like they converge to some good state with classical engineering. So that's what engineer, classical engineering helps us do. In reactive operations, we have, OK, like inventory of things that could be like hazardous to your application. You need to know them, add redundancies. Like you can use feature flag to deploy code to production. Uh, you can do dark deploys where you push it out, and then it's just like it's out in the world, but no traffic has been turned on. And you can have also like run books and documentation are very important. And you can just like have canaries. And, and these are the things that you can do within the reactive operations to make an application much more resilient. And in Ununk, uh, you can do like formal methods, fault injection, and things that allow you to do some sort of system verification of stuff 
that you couldn't have predicted. Also, uh, uh, the goal between these three areas is to reduce like, domain independence and then, like, to reduce the, the amount, the amount of like, the possibility for an error, but you do these different strategies. So this is what Paul tells us. Uh, when you think about building resilience, uh, using a single discipline is insufficient. So if you think about it from one single perspective, it's insufficient, and we need different strategies all at the same time which uh, kind of sucks, but uh, it does follow our intuition, but now it means that we have to attack three different areas, and then one of them can screw up any time. It's like, we just don't know what it's going to be, and it's not really great. All right, so I bummed you out enough. Uh, I, I've told you that there's different approaches, so let's see how, what happens in industry with them. Obviously, whenever we talk about these things and how we're done like, at scale, you always have job, like, you, you have like the papers from a like, few companies, and, and, and Google is, is like, yes, I'm going to be a cliche here, but this paper is really, really good. And I really like this paper because they describe how they constructed their lock-in service. And then it's, it's, it's like a seminal paper, and it's really, really, really fantastic. And here are the key insights that I took from this paper. It's like they pondered doing this thing that managed distributed lock-in at a company scale, and they pondered two things whether they were going to build a library for developers to use or for engineers to use, or they're going to do a centralized service. And they chose to do a centralized service and provide the client libraries for people to use so they would have the control that is necessary to, like, to, to, just to, to do something that allows you to have resiliency. Also, they did uh, limit the, the, the scope of the problem by just only offering storage of small data files with restricted operations. And then they said on the paper something that is very... It's a little controversial, but and it hits close to home, so I have very like a lot of feels whenever somebody tells me this. But it's like, okay, in the paper they say that engineers don't plan for availability, consensus, primary elections, failures, their own bugs, operability, the future, and they also don't understand distributed system. And this shit is happening at Google. So, so like, okay, the, the monstrosity that is Google in terms of like systems, applications, and shared knowledge, and we get this insight from them. So it's, it's like, again, it's, it's, like it's pretty depressing. But then another thing that they, they tell us, too, is like, OK, we have a centralized service, or they have a centralized service to manage distributed lock-in, and, and it's hard to construct. So this is, these problems are inherently difficult, and they're difficult to reason with, and they're difficult to put out. And, and you can just like dedicate effort into architecting well if they're very well, like if they're very well scoped. And then the, they said that by having a service that everybody uses allowed them to pull resources and make sure that that service was very, very resilient and they just like threw everything at the service to make it fault tolerant. So that's pretty nice, right? Like if we're in a company of that size, some of these problems may be solved for us. And also they said that the Cook model says that people can do whatever the hell they want with our applications. They're like, eh, no, uh, you're going to do these two things and no more than these two things. And these are the primitives that we give you. So they say that if they restrict the, the user behavior, they can increase some of the resilience because they can, they can just narrow down the API for this particular service. All right, uh, and then also the consumers that, although they did that, they said that they found corner cases that were completely, like, like completely unpredictable to them. So again, we have this problem of unk unk popping up again. All right, so now Netflix, because everybody has to talk about Netflix when we talk about resilience, right? Mm. Are there any Netflix employees here? Oh, awesome, good, all right. So tons of things from Netflix, they started chaos engineering. There's a lot of patterns that are very good. I'm not gonna comment on them. Yeah, there's a lot of links. You can use all of these things that they say in here. They're still applied, they're still true. They're very good. Uh, but the thing that I find much more interesting these days is like, since they started with this chaos monkey, chaos engineering, they're now even going beyond the, the things that originally they told us to do, like this, these things, into something that is like a little cookie and a little bit like more science fiction-y, where they're like, all right, systems are complex. We can't reason about them. We might as well develop an intuition. And they have this thing that taps into all of their monitoring system and in real time shows how traffic flows and the entirety like death start of microservices, how it looks from like, per, like abstracted away. And have a demo of like how their Amazon regions would fail to each other, and then they have the little dots are like packets, and then they're like their requests, and then they have different colors when they're healthy, when they're not healthy, and that was pretty amazing. So imagine if we can have something like that for all of our applications, and we just like like see them. We're better at see them and, and like sucking like into intuiting things than we are at, about like analyzing metrics, graphics, and all of the things that we need to do in order for a system to work correctly. So that's pretty neat. 
So uh, since we cover Netflix it's very, very quickly, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of the things that we do at Fassi as well. So we have this system that is called Powderhorn. And these two people, like I work with them, uh, Tyler and Bruce, gave a talk in Barcelona a few years ago describing the story and the evolution of how we created our instant purging thing. So first one's B1, <laughs> B2, uh, and then in B3, we got it right after reading some literature. And we got it right by using a gossip protocol, and then it's called bimodal multicast. And then this talk is very nice because it describes the entire, the, 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 like the entire complexity. And our problem domain is, is very interesting because we deal with everything that is awful on the internet. So everything that is awful in the internet, we have to respond. And then this particular thing has to be very efficient, very fast, and it has to go everywhere in the globe and then invalidate your cache very, very quickly. And it does. So in this talk, like, you can learn a little bit more how we do it. And they use it by just using a gossip protocol. So on the NetSys area, which is like we have ways to programmatically like, interact with the internet, we have this thing called fail D. So you have the internet, and this is horribleness of like, everything. And then traffic comes to a pop. And you have this protocol that, that routes traffic to different, different servers. The problem is, is whenever one of these servers go back, the, problem, the, the protocol rearranges the table. And, and things shift. So if you had content in one of them, like your content gets moved, and you need to be able to do this. So the way that we solve this problem is by just hacking the protocol and using just MAC addresses and fake MAC addresses to, to be able to like predictably like route traffic around. Uh, this is also in a talk by one of my colleagues called Joao. So if you're interested in how we do that, this is a trick that we also use to just like, all right, the current infrastructure doesn't do it. Let's trick the current infrastructure to do the thing that we want and abuse this open configuration things and, and actually get more sane behavior and more resilient behavior from how and route traffic reliably within our own, within our own pops. And then like, I'm going to talk about then a little bit of my team. So for the last nine months, I think it's nine months, right? It's September. So yes, nine months. It is September. Yes, it is September. So for the last nine months, I've been like, trying to start something new. And then there's different challenges. This, this, this thing about trying to make something resilient is very important to me because now I'm going to be responsible for a system that I have to support as well and other people are going to be dependent on. And we're in beta, and it's great. And then we discover something, and, and now I'm here, and everybody's working on a problem that I just can't help. So, so it's great. I'm going to tell you then what my system does. So you have a, a, a user that just come to our CDN, and then they, see, they have my service. And, and we go to the origin and fetch, they fetch the images, and then we resize them fast, uh, and then return them back. to. And then we, we resize them, and then we put them on, on, on our CDN, and then it goes back to whatever device or whatever like, customer or whatever client you have for that particular content piece. So again, because I was doing fast, I want a picture of my dog. My picture of my dog lives over there, and I want it resized this big. I have to figure out, like, or the team that, that we're on, we have to figure out how to do that more efficiently and then just like, and, and, and very, very fast. So in a way, the, 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 the advantages that we have is that this system is stateless. I, I don't have to keep the, the copy of the original. I only have to transform it very quickly, which should be like, easy, because like, when you don't have state to deal with, you have a little bit more allowances, and your system can be more resilient. And I don't have to keep anything, no coordination, no database. I don't have to use things that are like harvest and yield in the sense of like how much data I give out. But I still have to be available, and then data has to still come out. The thing that's most difficult for us is how we, like, how we thought about the request cycle through all the dependencies that we have. And, and the dependencies are the hardest thing, uh, the hardest thing, because this application has to be it's everything, like customer setup. If you messed up where your images live, and you like, for example, screwed up your S3 like bucket permissions, we already cannot access it, and then that disrupts our system. Uh, if the caching layer is having a problem, we need to be able to know that the caching layer is, 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 is having issues, and then just not send traffic back to the caching layer. The interaction between every point is, is very complicated and it's very complex, and this is a thing that actually like has cost us the biggest the biggest time. Like our design design time has gone up front to figuring out this thing. And, and we, even the libraries that we use can have problems. So at this point, we're thinking about resiliency on every interface and every area that our, our application covers, and, and, and it's hard. Uh, so I was thinking, all right, all right. Uh, another thing that has been, has been related to how we deal with resiliency is like how you define your error types and what you decide to expose versus not. Because sometimes you think that uh, uh, sometimes you could be just hiding away information and your system is less, re is less resilient than it should be. 
because you're just simply not thinking about it, like exposing this 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 problem that you're having, and and handling those carefully like is is very important. So in this case, uh, failure detection and system operability are ongoing concerns for us. We have many servers, we have many many locations, and if one of our servers goes down. Again, as I mentioned, the interaction between the edge and us uh, has to be like synchronized. Like, if we're in a state where we can't take traffic, we have to signal the edge and who's talking to us to actually not send us traffic. Okay, so this is getting boring. Uh, in a sense, it's like it's complicated and it's hard. Uh, and, and another thing that that is very is very helpful when you're iterating this fast is to have intermediate versions for things that you save. So, for example. We version the way that we represent things internally. And the thing that you want to know about that, if you're ever doing that, it's very good to have it from the get-go as part of your design. But you should, you should like, know that you're gonna, you should have to support for mixed mode. And this means that if I have version 2 on this server, version 1 is, could be on, on the other server, and both of them need to be able to communicate. And that is missed very, very frequently. When you forget that you need to support mixed mode, happens like it, it happens more frequent than not. It's 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 like it's a huge uh, it's a huge threat to your availability and your resiliency. All right, you want versioning of, for everything. All right, so we covered a little bit of literature. We covered a little bit of like how companies think about it. Let's summarize it because uh, I oh the person that was asleep woke up. So so it's great. So let's let's then just like like summary like summarize a little bit of this. Okay. So in our application or anything else, uh, things that have to deal with redundancies are, are very important. So you add resilience by just putting more of it. And then again, we saw this in the in the things before, but you have like redundancy of like resources, execution. Even for example, like whenever we're talking about a purging mechanism, this thing gossips. So it's more than one message that goes out, and this is redundancy of messages. And this help you like stand up, like or be able to like withstand uh, circumstances or things that you didn't plan. So all right, all of those build resiliency, and also like something that is very important too is like capacity planning is still something that that is worthy of an exercise. And now I'm trying to even just do reason through capacity planning to the point in. Like it's, it's correlated even to the power that we have available in a rack. How many operations can I do for the amount of power that this server that I have installed in a pop consumes? And that is, that is also hard. And also, that when you're trying to make optimizations, like in the Cook model, say you're trying to save some money, or you're trying to go like, th that particular set of optimizations may remove some of your redundancies, and then make your system, may make your system less stable. All right, so we want to have more things, and we want to be able to, like, to, 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 to just test them and then just have them out. So redundancies are key. As we saw in the Cook model, operations are very important. And, and when you don't know like, how close you are to the, the error boundary, uh, it means that we are always guessing. And we don't really know how close we are. And if your operations are complex, if, for example, your deploy process takes like 20 steps and they are like, done by hand, you are going to get it wrong. And this is going to cost you an, an outage. This is going to cost you a problem. And, and the thing that is interesting, too, is like you that when you are like implementing your system. Operability is also something that you design. So it's important. And also, like, OK, things are complex. We are building distributed systems. They are like, they're, they're very hard. They can fail. They can have all sorts of crazy shenanigans. Uh, uh, but sometimes complexity is good. And then when you're dealing with complexity, sometimes it's very, very hard to make something very simple to operate. And then in that sense, that complexity is good, because you have invested a lot of time and invested a lot of effort into make something simple to interact with. So, so if it increases safety, then it's, it's good. And also, like, you should know that resiliency sometimes will come at the cost of other goals. Like, if you want to make a system that is resilient, it's not going to be cheap. You're going to have to have more of it. And, and it may be just time consuming, because it takes time to make this thing. So it's like it will come at a cost of something else. All right. So again, so we want to like leverage engineering best practices. We saw like a pattern emerging that the things that we know that we should be doing are actually helpful, and they're helpful in different planes, right? Uh, so we want to do them. Testing and resiliency are correlated. You still have to do it. I'm sorry that there's no magic bullet there. Versioning is important. Uh, provide an it provides you an upgrade path. It's very very good. Um, okay, so the upgrades and evolvability of a system is still tricky. Again, mixed mode is important. We recently forgot to account for this, so but we fixed it. Uh, but uh, having been burned by this one, now I'm like I see it everywhere. And also, I feel that's an interesting thing because we should be able to like 
the way that we prototype system, I think, is fundamentally broken. Like, we start creating the things, and, and, and there's just too much, too many areas of attack. And, and if, you, like, if you push something out and then, like, you follow these patterns, it's like, like you have to still revisit every single aspect and constantly check them and see how well you're doing. And, and that takes effort and takes a lot of discipline. And, and we don't seem to have like ways to construct applications better. And then that's my rant on, on, on yeah, okay. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, it's laborious, it's worth doing. And it doesn't seem like for distributed systems, there's that much mechanization or things that get done for you. So, so that's, that's, that's a little sad. So uh, let's, let's wrap it up a little bit. Like, let's start just bringing it home, because probably like, I'm running out of time. Oh, cool. Uh, all right, so, so again, this is my TLDR. We've seen different things. We've seen patterns in academia that highlighted the importance of good design. We've seen patterns in academia or even system safety that, that tells us how we operate and how we interact with our applications is very, very important. And, and, and what we expose and what people are going to do with our systems are things that we cannot expect. And then we see in the Borel model that although like, we may be very good at those things, there's still going to th be things that we missed, and there's still going to be challenges that we could have never predicted. And there's nothing that past us could have done to, like, to help us in, 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 in the moment that we're in. And there are some things, but, but this is where like, I think maybe some, some higher level, of, but this is maybe where I think the future is going to help us the most how we simulate, how, you, how we model the, the, the systems before we even construct them. And I think that that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, that that's where, where, where we're going to see like, the biggest like, returns. Maybe we have a language. Oh, there was a paper where like, Microsoft described this language where as you made a change, it went to the cloud and ran formal methods on everything you have to let you know if you had violated an assumption. And that's amazing. So like, if we can do that as part of our like, development environment or how we develop, that would be great. So like, since we're talking about the future, that will be the future that I want to live in. But all right, let's summarize it then. We have here are the things that we could do in design. And in design, we could do, all right, we have to figure out, are we favoring like, harvest? Are we favoring yield? We need to make this decision explicit. Uh, we, can, like, we can use orthogonality as in like, we can just like, have different areas with different responsibilities. Or decomposition are like for the win, things that help you. Uh, do we have enough redundancies in place? This happens in design. Uh, are we resilient to our dependencies? That's much harder to do than, than, than it sounds. And also, like, theory matters. Because sometimes this problem that you're running into has already been studied, and a solution has been already proposed decades before you run into this problem. And it's nice to be able to borrow from that and then just start from a point where, where, where it's, it's well known that it, that it works. Operability. Are you providing enough control to your, to your operators or your users? And big, a big question that will let you know if your system is resilient or not is, would you like to be on call for it? So that would be really good. Once you're on call, everything that is shitty in your system will wake you up at the craziest times of the day. So, so, so that, that motivation is real. So I, uh, I think people should be on call for their own applications, so especially if you're responsible for it. Uh, you should rank your services in terms of like, what can be dropped. When you're talking about harvest and yield, if you have uh, things that are not important and you can just drop them and shed them when you are in, in, in situations that are, that, are, that are problematic, then your system can continue to make progress as well. And monitoring and alerting are very important. They should be in place. They should be part of your MVP. And when things that have to do with the unknown unknowns, the existence of like stress, uh, actually like the, the unknown unknown, like stress is how important the first two areas are, and how when you cut corners on the first two, you are moving closer to the error boundary, and on top of that, you have this extra area that is as big as the first two that is coming for you, and, and it's going to ruin your life and ruin your, we your weekend. How we done everything we can. And if everything else fails, uh, you, uh, we don't do this in San Francisco yet. We don't have enough interns. But you can start like, doing human sacrifices. Uh, that works. Uh, anyway, maybe when you're on call, that is a, a version of a human sacrifice. So you solve this unk unk problem by putting, like, putting the burden in a, poor, in a poor person, in a poor human being. Uh, more. You should do these things, test, code reviews are good. Uh, distrust claim behavior is good, even if they're internal, because sometimes you can do those your own application from your, from, your, from your own company easier than somebody else can. 
Uh, version is good. Remember, mix mode. Checksums are very good. And then you have things like error handle, circuit breakers. It's like, again, if you can just like shut down traffic to certain areas so you can still continue to make progress. Back pressure is important. Leases are important. Uh, timeouts are important. Just like make sure that those things happen while you're in design, or at least you have like a node to just go back and, and think about them. And operability automation is uh, uh, anything that you don't, you fail to automate is going to be something that you run into when you are drunk at 3 a.m. and you have, uh, you get paid. Uh, it's, it's very important to do that. And then release stability, like is often tied to system stability. If it takes you forever to release your application or do a deploy, then uh, it's it's very common. It's often you're gonna make it like you're gonna get it wrong at some point. Playbooks are good. You should link your alerts to things that, that are actionable. Like if you see something pop up, it should have a link to how you monitor, or how, how you debug it, or how you troubleshoot it. Uh, and okay, and also like how you configure your system has to be conf consolidated, especially if you have many of them. If in one system you do it with like for example a data bag in Chef, and the other one you have a config file, when you're moving from one to the other, and it, it should be like it should be much more like straightforward and should be able to like have some common patterns for how you configure your system across your organization. All right, and also like the important thing is that you should keep in mind that your operators determine also how resilient your system is. How like the, the people that are using it, like the people that are like helping you just like run it, like the, 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 just, they are like also helping you determine how resilient your application is. I could be the, have the same, the, the first, like the most amazing system and if it's a pain in the ass to monitor, like nobody's going to go and read through my logs uh, and, and, and see what happens. Uh, it will be made hard sometimes. All right, so this was me last year. It's like, I was like, we can't recover from lack of design. Design is all of the things that matter. I'm not minded either harvest yield or not being aware of everything. Uh, means that we're gonna sign up for a redesign. The moment we finished coding, and I was very idealistic, and I felt that I was very arrogant and stupid. It's like, now that I have something new, this thing about redesign, has already happened in different areas, and we got it wrong. So I was like, okay, fuck. Like the design is like it's, it's hard. Like having a good design is hard. The unknowns are like super hard to predict. Like the, the dependencies even are super hard to like to to just like to to reason through. So I felt like my original apprehension about everything should happen in design is, is incorrect. Like I, I think that maybe like. Uh, like redesigns are, are, are a part of having a system that evolves. Maybe like I think about it now in terms of like, all right, I touch this. Is my assumption still valid a few months on the road? Is my assumption still valid? And, and, and then like maybe now, like I think that the, when I look at a problem or when I look at something else, I just go through the checklist of everything that I have. Am I doing all of the things? And what did I miss? And maybe I shouldn't really like try to fight so much the redesign and also like think about it more in terms of ad adaptability. And I think that that is kind of nice. And, and I think that is a better way, or it's a way that I like to live more with the terms of like, that is a way that makes me happier when I think about resilience. Because we know that we're gonna have to change. We know that a lot of things have to be reconstructed when your assumptions change or the world decides to throw you something that is completely bananas. And, and, and before I was like, everything should happen in design. And then now it's like, okay, this, there's an evolution to this. And then this is the reason also like why sometimes when you read literature or things from big companies, they have decades of effort and labor trying to figure out we can start from there, but in our applications, we're still going to have to like have this, this, this type of evolution, this type of thinking and maturity. So that's all I got. I don't have any time for questions, but all of my, all of my papers, all of my research are all in a, in a repo. So you can open an issue if you have a question. I'm going to be around, and I hope I didn't talk too fast. I look like I have, so uh, sorry. Uh, so. Thank you.